Okay, it is Wednesday, and Wednesday is my favorite day of the week. I get to have really cool conversations with really fantastic people. And it seems like each and every Wednesday, it just gets better and better and better. No offense to anyone had previous cursing with. This community is so fantastic. And today I am so, so, so excited to uh, introduce you guys to my guest today. But before Aaron and I get to it, it's really important, I think for both of us, I think Aaron would agree with me, that we would love to thank Shelly Lynn for this opportunity for us to be here to share Aaron's story with you. Um, and just for her vision in general, the Pursuit 3 project, it's so special. And um, I know I'm so honored to be a part of it and um, to help share people's stories. It's all so, so, so important that we thank our uh, Talk Wednesday sponsor, Leanne Miles at the Clinton Wilkins Mortgage Team. Thank you, thank you, Leanne, for your sponsorship. That allows us to be here sharing um, these fantastic uh, co-authors, entrepreneurs, business owners, Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, with all of you. Okay, so Aaron, Aaron Price is coming to us today from Penticton, BC, which is like, honest to God, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Aaron, are you from Penticton or is Penticton um, somewhere you landed? And and yeah, what's, what's the story of how Aaron um, got to Penticton? I was drawn by the sun. I didn't grow up in Penticton. I grew up in Vancouver. And then when I was about 23 or 24, I moved to North Vancouver, Deep Cove specifically, which is gorgeous, but dark and rainy. And I'm a sun lover. So at a certain point in my life, COVID was a part of it. I was like, I'm not putting off my dream of living in a sunny place anymore. I'm doing it now. I'm moving. And here I am. And I really love it here. It suits me very, very well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, being a gal who lived in the lower mainland, I married a boy from Chilliwack, BC. I lived uh, in the West for 13 years. I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, I was just sharing with Aaron before we hit record, I'm actually about to get on a plane and head to God's country. Uh, I will be in the to myself working, uh, on my friend's vineyard for the next couple of weeks. So I'm so excited to, um, you know, get back into the, it, it truly is a special, special place. So you grew up in Vancouver and, um, you know, now you're in Penticton. So you, you have a lot of aspects to your business. So has this business and what you do, um, has this evolved over time or did you, you know, has it been a passion for you for a long time? Is this something you started back in Vancouver and brought with you to Penticton or something that, you know, has been birthed more of the shine uh, in the interior? It's definitely developed over time. Myself as a healer is part of my DNA. It's just how I am made up. And I knew as a teenager that I was a helper. I just didn't know what that looked like. I got into the healing arts in my early 20s with energy healing and yoga and meditation. But it wasn't until I got into massage therapy that I felt like I had something more concrete that the world understood because, you know, 25 years ago, energy healing was pretty fringy. Now it's still kind of fringy, but 25 years ago, it required a lot of education on, you know, what it can do and how you can help people. And now there's so much more research that's gone into it that shows, you know, what's happening when people are working in an energetic field, but I felt like I needed something more understandable that didn't create, you know, such dissonance between people's belief systems and their ability to access healing and health and care. So I went into massage therapy and I was super jazzed by it in the beginning, like when I was in school, but once I actually got into practice, I was really not in love with massage therapy. It was didn't provide the level of meaning that I was looking for. And it was really hard on my body. And I actually got into a crisis of faith over whether I was, this was the way I was supposed to be helping people. And I 
was really looking for solutions on how can I work in a way that will save my body so I'm not burning myself out, I'm not creating chronic pain. How can I do work that's a lot more meaningful and reach more people than I was able to do before? So when I started working with people going through breast cancer, it was an absolute game changer for me on so many different levels because it provided work that was meaningful. It provided a lighter touch treatment so it was more sustainable for my body and it created avenues for resilience and healing for people in a way that they didn't have before because at the moment the standard of care when somebody goes through surgery for breast cancer is that mostly they're just sent home from hospital and it's up to their own they're left to their own devices on how to heal and some people really don't know what to do and it can create a lot of long-term suffering and pain that really doesn't need to be there so when I started working with this population, I it vastly changed my approach to healing and health. And I brought in, you know, all the trauma centered care that I'd learned over the years and using my intuition and it coupled it with the science and the research and knowing how to blend these two approaches together to create some pretty extraordinary treatments for people. So that was wonderful and you know revitalizing for me in my practice but it wasn't until covid hit that i actually had the space both in my calendar like actual space um, because i interrupted my practice for five months but also the mental space to be able to put all these ideas into action that i'd had for years and i just didn't have the bandwidth to actually put them into into practice so when covid hit and i wasn't physically practicing, then I created the mastectomy guide. And what this started as was a home care support program, a video program for patients so that they were able to access the care and the resources that they needed when they couldn't come and see me in person in my massage therapy practice. And, you know, out of COVID also came the desire to move because I realized you never know what the world is going to bring to you. And if you keep delaying your dreams, because you think later is going to be better. You don't know what later is bringing. So better to say yes to your dreams now. And therefore I moved to, you know, a sunny, drier climate that's better for my spirit. So I brought what I'd done with the mastectomy guide to date with me to the Okanagan, but I was commuting back and forth between the Okanagan and North Vancouver to still service my patients. And I realized, okay, this is not sustainable. So I need to start reproducing myself and creating more people who are comfortable working with breasts and chests. And then I started the training programs for the mastectomy guide. And that's when I, you know, I created these accredited training programs for massage therapists who want to learn to support people either going through breast cancer, elective breast surgeries, or gender affirming top surgery. Because what I realized over the years, even though I started with breast cancer, I moved into people getting elective breast surgeries and then also people getting their gender affirming top surgery. And the same story applied to all the populations, which is mostly they're sent home from hospital with little to no resources and they don't know what to do and they don't know how to heal. And I thought this is unacceptable in a developed society. You know, we offer one of the most progressive societies that this planet has to date. And even so, there's so many people falling through the cracks and creating this very challenged quality of life in the years after their surgery. So there was sort of a cascading series of events that happened to bring me to where I am today. But I can happily say I am completely in love with massage therapy. I have no chronic pain. I have so much meaning and purpose in my work. And I'm now able to reach way more people than I could do when I was just doing my one on one practice. So altogether, it's been quite a journey and super fun. Yeah. And now I get to be here talking with people like yourself who are helping to spread the word. So thank you. And thanks to Shelly also for creating this ability for, you know, bringing people together to be able to tell their story. Wow, such a such a colorful um, background, and and what was great as you spoke, it's it's almost like I was roller coaster, and I I could feel um, 
your energy increase, you know, as, as you progress through your story and you can really feel that you have truly landed on what lights you up and, you know, you're obviously a helper and a healer and, you know, to really have taken the, the gift of the time that COVID gave, you know, to really be able to go inward and, and evaluate what's important to you, but also realize, you know, that there's problems that need to be solved and, and to be able to plug those holes. It's so, 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 so special. So, all right. So I, I'm curious here. So what, what are some of the main issues, let's say, that that you address, you know, specifically in the mastectomy world, or um, like, what are some of the main uh, roadblocks or difficulties, trials that they come up against? Uh, post surgery, that you know we're falling through the cracks. That you know that you were, uh, that you're so passionate about helping people address. What what is you know what's your what's your specialty there? There's a few different things that seem to come up chronically, and you know it depends on what their reason is for getting the surgery. But a very common thing is chronic pain for one where people just have this pain that will not quit and it can go on for years and decades, which they're not prepared for. Two is they're not able to move their body effectively in the way that they want to be able to because the scar tissue can get so restrictive and very uncomfortable and it's hard to be able to breathe or stand upright or move their arms around. Um, also, body dysmorphia is a real thing, especially in the people who've had, they've had to lose a breast or have it significantly altered due to a potentially life-threatening illness like cancer, where they have to make a really hard choice between, do I save my breast? Do I save my life? If I choose to save my life and lose my breast, how do I actually live with that decision in the long term? Because now 89% of people are surviving breast cancer past the five-year mark, which is wonderful and so exciting. However, quality of life then becomes a real issue because back in the 40s, 25% of people were surviving. And so quality of life for those 25% was important, but 75% of people unfortunately were perishing. But now 89% of people are living longer lives past the five-year mark and often, you know, decades. They can be 50 years past their diagnosis and they're still going strong. But if they are hating their body, if they feel disfigured, if they are in pain, if they're not able to do the activities that they love, then their quality of life over that time period becomes severely compromised. And those are things that can be changed and significantly altered through mindful care. So if somebody is able to see a massage therapist right from the get-go, or even before their surgery, which is best, then they're able to address how their body heals and make a very significant change in how their body integrates the surgery. And so then in years to come, they can feel comfortable in their body. They don't have pain or minimal amounts of pain. They're able to move comfortably. They're able to, you know, do pickleball again or ride their bike again or pick up their grandkids again. They're able to feel proud of their body and the shape that they're in now because the shape that they have now may be different than what the shape nature gave them was. And so, you know, if they feel proud of their body now, then they're able to share it with an intimate partner and not feel ashamed of what they're bringing, which, you know, really doesn't need to happen. It's it's those kinds of things that when they're left unattended to can create such long-term suffering, but they don't need to be there. Those are types of suffering that they have solutions and people just need to know what they can do, where they can go, who they can see and what they can do for themselves. Because especially during a cancer diagnosis where, you know, often it can be a very disempowering process to know that there are things that you can do to partner with the process to create the best possible result can be very empowering. And it's just a bit of education and some strategies that you need to employ in order to 
promote that resilience and that autonomy through that situation. But also, you know, someone who is trans or non-binary and they're going through their top surgery, you know, that's a very empowering process as part of their medical transition to presenting to the world the body that they felt like they should have had from nature, but nature gave them the opposite hormones than what they were, you know, what they felt like they should have had. So a part of their medical transition is to create the breast or chest shape that they want and that they feel like is appropriate for them. And to be able to give them a place for safe care where there's people who offer non-judgmental touch and there's things that they can do at home through yoga or stretching or self-massage, all of that creates legitimacy in their transition process. And these are the things that need to be normalized so that it's not taboo, it's not strange, and there's the appropriate resources out there. And, you know, even same story, someone going through their elective breast surgery, maybe they're getting an augmentation to get a bigger cup size, or maybe they nature gave them too much breast tissue and they're doing a reduction. You know, the different reasons people have for getting elective surgeries, they also need somewhere where this type of care is normalized and they don't need to feel awkward or strange or like this is a weird thing to ask for. I've had patients call me up and they're like, I feel kind of weird asking about this, but is this something that you can do that you can help me with? And I'm like, yes, this is my jam. I'm here to help. So, you know, creating that pathway for people to be able to access what they need and not feel marginalized or like they're invisible or strange for feeling like they need this kind of care. Like all of that is part of the mission that I've got with the mastectomy guide. And part of why I'm so grateful to be able to talk on platforms because it just helps get the word out there. Like, yes, this is actually a thing. And yes, this is care that people can receive and it's legit and all above board. Yeah. Well, and as you were talking to like my, my brain, you know, goes back to, you know, my, my mom went through cancer, you know, had a mastectomy back in the eighties, you know, when it, you know, like you laid in front of the butcher, so to speak, right? Like, thankfully things have come a long way, but you know, she has lived with that chronic pain about, and it's just something that she learned to accept. And for her, it was part of that. She, she learned to accept it as her, her reminder, you know, that, Hey, I got pain, but I'm, I'm still here, you know, and she was the only one in her cancer group that did survive, you know, in speaking with you and learning that, that pain that she has literally lived with for the last 30 years, 40 years, you know, necessary. And, um, you know, so there's a part of my, you know, there's a part of my heart that swells when I'm, when I'm hearing you. And then there's a part of me that wants to cry. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to lean into the, you know, the swelling of the heart, you know, that, you know, luckily we are evolving and we're, you know, we're learning and with people like you, um, sharing your gifts and, um, realizing these things and helping, um, you know, I, I, so that, and so, you know, thank you because to know that, uh, other individuals don't have to suffer, um, that, that is so special. That is so, so special. All right. So we know that you're very, very passionate, um, in this mastectomy world. So I've learned though, that, you know, you, you, you are, Maybe this is my question. Are you still uh, a yoga instructor? Uh, do you still practice? Do you, where does yoga fit into into Aaron's world overall? At the moment with the yoga, it's I created this self-paced library. So if you go to the mastectomy guide and you look under the patient programs, you'll see the um, MG library for yoga because I realized with yoga, it's actually a risk factor for people who've gone through breast cancer surgery because their lymph system is often altered. They may have some muscles there, some muscles not. Parts of their body have been, you know, recreated into a breast. And it, I mean, it's absolutely astonishing what the human body will go through, especially to recreate breasts. And it 
gives you a sense of how vital this part of the body is for people, what they're willing to go through in order to recreate the shape they feel like they need. And so with the yoga, um, I've specially adapted the yoga to be appropriate for people who've gone through breast and chest surgery so that there's modifications built into every class. There's um, specific strengthening patterns and stretching patterns that are appropriate for people who've gone through the surgeries and even for the trans people so that they have a place where they can go and have on demand access to the classes that will show them, you know, this is how you need to move your arm after you've had these types of surgeries. These are movement patterns that you can do that can help you have a feeling of release and ease across your chest and help you regain your posture again. So all of those are on demand. They're available 24 seven and uh, they're available under the patient tab on the mastectomy guide homepage or on the menu bar. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. That is incredible. It's amazing again. Cause ha had you ever dreamt of doing anything online pre COVID, uh, you know, were you one of those people that were sort of, you know, ahead of the game or, you know, was that truly one of those COVID gifts that, uh, that came to you? I had thought about it before COVID because I wanted to be able to reach more people. It's one of the drawbacks of being a massage therapist. It's like a double-edged sword because when you're working with people one-on-one, -on -one, you get a beautiful experience up close and personal of what they're going through, but you can only reach a certain number of people because you only have a certain number of hours in a day and a certain number of treatments per week. And, you know, so you, you automatically have a cap in the number of people that you can reach. And I was never satisfied with that. So I wanted to create online programming so that I could reach more people. I just didn't really know how that was going to operate because massage is something that's very tangible and you're in the room with the person. So yoga was actually one of the first ways that I started being able to reach people during COVID and um, cause I was like, well, this is something you can transmit online easily and I could reach my patients. And so at that point they were live classes that people would show up for. And then I started realizing, okay, there's other ways that you can transmit the healing online without having to actually be in the room, but you can still replicate a lot of the things that are available through massage therapy. And a lot of it is in self-care. So like self-care is an absolute life raft. And for myself, I'll just share a bit of this story. I had some pretty traumatic childhood incidents, incidents that, you know, I needed self-care early on. So when I was 12, I started with journaling. And then when I was 14, I started with meditation. And then when I was 20, I started with yoga and it was my life raft and I needed it because without it, I do not know where I would have ended up. I could have been in a very different circumstance than what I'm in now. And I really believe a lot of my health that I have now, my functionality, my capacity to regenerate and be resilient came from self-care. And so I wanted to be able to teach other people how to be resilient and how to get through hard things by taking care of yourself. And COVID actually created a, a good window for that because access to in-person care was so compromised that I wanted people to know there's stuff that you can do yourself and to get that sense of empowerment for, you know, knowing that you can combine a whole bunch of very small steps that are not onerous, but if you continue them over time, mm -hmm you can create massive change in yourself, in your mind, in your body, in your health. And, you know, self-care is where it's at, honest to God. And especially now that even though we're, you know, not in COVID the way that we were before, stress on the medical system is enormous. A lot of people don't have access to primary care. They can't get a doctor. They can't see a nurse. Emerge might be their only option, but they have to wait, you know, six hours for a short thing. And then they won't really get their issue attended to properly that, through those channels anyway. So it's a challenged healthcare system that we're in. And, you know, for people to know that there are things that they can do for themselves to create that sense of empowerment and resilience is invaluable. And then to be able to train other massage therapists, you know, that 
is often the medical person that they will have access to because they can't see their doctor. They can't see a nurse practitioner. There's just, they're, it's not available. So they might go see a massage therapist. But one of the things that massage therapists have had difficulty with, which is something that I'm addressing in my programs, the training programs, is the confidence to work in the breast and chest area. Because, you know, for a lot of people, they're told that's a no-fly zone. Do not go there. And, you know, there's a lot of fear. And how do I do this ethically so that people know this is something safe? I'm not going to be compromising them at all. Everything is with informed consent. And, you know, there's processes and protocols that you need to go through so that nobody is caught unaware. The patient totally understands what's happening. The massage therapist feels confident. They know what's happening underneath the skin, how to approach the patient with human centered care. And, you know, all things need to work together in order for that appropriate um, avenue to be wide open for everybody to get what they need. Wow. Wow. So my, my, like my mind is kind of on, on overload here. I, I just, um, I, I, I'm truly speechless because it's like my, my brain is trying to process all the incredible information that you just shared. And it's kind of like, I think I'm at a point where it's like, I, I don't even want to say anything because I don't want to take away from everything that you just said, because I, I, what you just shared is it's huge. It's huge. And it's amazing at what we don't know. It's amazing what we don't know. So thank you, um, a for, for learning and being willing to share your knowledge and to uplift others and, you know, and start a ripple effect. Um, cause that's, that's really what, uh, what we need more of in the world. So thank you so much for that. Okay. So clearly from what you've shared, you have a ton of information and resources and whatnot on your, um, website, which we have the banner shown here, um, on the screen. Are you a social media gal though at all, Erin? Do you love to hang out on socials or are you more just a, you know, some people don't like people, you know, prefer to just kind of um, live their life off, you know, offline, so to speak. But, um, you know, if people are in that social world. Can they find you there? They can find me. Yeah, I'm on, uh, I'm mastectomy guide either on Facebook or on Instagram I'm not naturally oriented towards social media. So this is a real area of growth for me to make sure that my business is visible online um, because, you know, you just, you need to have that presence there. So there are resources that are there. I do free master classes for any therapists who are wanting to learn more about how to do this work. And I'm actually going to have a free master class coming up on July the 11th at 12 o'clock on the science of scar tissue. And uh, any massage therapist, no matter where you live, because it's virtual, if you want to tune in and you want to learn three ways that we can influence collagen and scar tissue formation through massage therapy, then that's a really good opportunity. So I'll have that information up shortly on the website. It's not there right now, but um, it will be there soon. And also on my Facebook page and on the Instagram so that people are able to find that information there. Oh, I should also say that I do Fantastic. training. Therapists. Oh, thank you. Sorry. There's a, there's a delay in this. So I never know if um, I've stopped or you're, you're starting, but there, the massage therapy training is offered both virtually and in person. So no matter where you live, if you're interested in learning to work with this population, then please reach out and, and connect with us because no matter where you live, we want to make sure that you get the resources that you need so that you're, as a massage therapist, you're supported, you've got people around you who care and who can train and who are there to help you facilitate your practice and opening to this beautiful demographic to work with. And if you're a patient, then we have resources for you so that you can get immediately 24 seven help in no matter where you are in your healing journey. So like your mom, who was back in the eighties when they were aggressive with their surgeries and people just didn't talk about it in the same way, 
she can get help because we offer how to do self your own self massage and how to do stretching and strengthening for posture alignments and the yoga is there. So, you know, no matter where a person is on their journey, if they're before surgery, which is ideal, or they're decades after, there's resources that are there. So please reach out and and check out the mastectomyguide.com because that is where you're going to find this hub of therapists who can help you, therapists that want to be trained, patients who need the resources that they have, like all of it's there. It's this umbrella that's there. So go visit. <laughs> okay. There we go. There we go. That's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for, for what you do, Erin. And uh, again, it's always so, so exciting for me to connect with each of these individuals and to feel what people are passionate about. Um, and, um, and every person I get a chance to talk to, I, I get my mind blown in some way, shape or form. And speaking with you today was definitely no exception. So mastectomy, uh, mastectomy guy, um, a plethora of information and, um, Aaron's your gal and clearly, clearly, clearly she wants to help. So thank you for that, Aaron. And anything you want to um, leave our, our listeners with any little nugget of wisdom or a favorite quote or something like that, that you'd like to end the, end the episode with? I would say resilience is a learned skill and it's something that everybody can cultivate. So no matter where you are right now, whether you are a patient who is struggling with chronic pain or body dysmorphia or scar tissue that you feel uncomfortable with, whether you're a massage therapist and you're feeling flat in your practice or you're in chronic pain, maybe you had an injury and you need to revitalize your practice or you've had people coming in and you're like, I don't know how to help them. I feel totally at a loss. That capacity to regenerate yourself and change your trajectory so that you're on a new one is available in the present moment, every single moment. You just have to say yes. And that is what I would wish for you. Love it. That's a mic drop. We're going to drop the mic and thank you, Aaron. Thank you to Shelly and thank you to Leanne um, for this great opportunity for yet another um, wealth of information uh, with our latest Talk Wednesday. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we will see you next.